Uh, my name is Travis Nesky. I am the owner of Sip Coffee and Beer uh, here in Scottsdale. Um, what an awesome turnout we have here. Again, when we first started doing these chamber meetings, we did them every month. Uh, they kind of rotated around a different small business, which was really cool, but uh, we didn't have that good a turnout. So uh, we revamped them and, and started out with this program. Uh, I think this is our second one, right? This is our second one here at this location. We had over 100 people last. Well, this one we had 171 confirmed, so it's really cool for us to all see that. So we really appreciate uh, you all coming out here. Um, again, with that, us going to this quarterly approach, we're doing, we really want to try to pack these things full. Uh, so you all walk out of here really feeling like your time was well spent. So we ask that you uh, take advantage of it well, introduce yourselves to the people who are sitting next to you, maybe you don't know them. We really hope that you all come out of here with some good quality relationships. So you extend those to help your businesses and, 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 and the like. So um, enjoy the program. We've heard uh, a lot of people talking about the marketing aspects of things with you and your small businesses. So uh, hopefully you all get some of that uh, from this meeting here today. That's it for me. We'll get a bit on to our famous Mayor Lane here to come up and uh, kick it off for us. Thanks, Travis, and uh, really good morning to everybody. It's wonderful to be here with you once again uh, for a tremendous effort that we have uh, with the Chamber and in partnership with the City of Scottsdale's Economic Development Department and in collaboration with other organizations and agencies within the city, inclusive of tourism and events and transportation. I think they're here, as well as our, our destination marketing firm, and that is Experience Scottsdale, all with a great effort, really, to create a bit positive and a great and open business environment. It's really a testament, really, as we look at this, uh, the crowd and the and really, I think the appreciation is shown by our business community for what we're trying to accomplish here, and that is to provide as positive a business environment, and frankly, as a connective one as possible. And wherever possible, you know, providing a little bit additional insight. As a city, we uh, typically try to stay out of the way about when we can facilitate and help businesses to make sure that uh, we're dealing with their issues as well as uh, the issues within the business community that, that are helpful for them to be connected. That's what it's, it's really all about. So we really are very excited to have this kind of thing and, and to have this kind of organization. But we also want to, I want to thank the Chamber, really, for what they do in this, in this connection and how important they see it along with ourselves. <clears throat> and it's, it's great testament as to how we're all working together to do a better job for all of us in this community. And frankly, the exposure in, in, uh, of all the businesses that are here in Scottsdale. Uh, you know, I, I oftentimes say, and you've probably heard me say this before, and so there's a, there's a real responsibility uh, to provide that positive environment. Uh, and one of the consequences of that is we've been rated as the 13th happiest city in the country. So I have uh, you know, a civic responsibility to get happy and get happier. Yeah, well, well, I don't know about that. I guess most of the people are happy and that's the way it's portrayed. But nevertheless, I will say that it's really a, it's important to get off that 13 and get on up into the top 10 for sure. Uh, so we keep going, working on that. Uh, it's, um, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to thank the, the Chamber again. Uh, it really is a great relationship, and frankly, uh, their interaction uh, with our members and with the community at large has been just outstanding, and we very much appreciate that and, and how that's been working for us. Uh, it's great to see everybody out here early in the morning. i got to tell you, it's a little bit in these dark uh, days of the winter, you know, uh, getting up in the dark and cold. I mean, I know it's nothing sufferable. <laughs> <laughs>
This is a unique web-based mapping tool. Uh, you can actually get access to all kinds of free data and information and available commercial properties in Scottsdale. So if you haven't gone there, please check out that tool. It also combines um, size, use, cost, contact information on properties, but also demographic reports, consumer spending, and all kinds of detailed business data for, uh, for your neighbors. Size Up is also a small business research tool that we offer, and, and the, this is also embedded in our website at choosescottsdale.com. You can use it to see what workers are being paid in your industry to see if you're kind of in line, um, or, you know, hey, I'm not getting good applicants, what's the deal? Um, uh, you can also try to figure out the best zip codes to advertise in based on consumer sales and income, and it also tells you about your local competition or potential business partners in the area. So we'd encourage you to play with that, and if you want some guidance and help on using that tool, let us know. Um, great. Um, so we also have a, a small business training series. I know we have some folks here who have been very religious about attending that. I know the folks from Joyrides have, have come to all of those. Thank you, guys. Um, we're in our third year of offering coursework, and then we have, um, we're freshening up the topic this spring, so we're still finalizing that, but these courses are free. Um, I do know that we're going to be trying to, um, trying to tweak this a little bit so it appeals even more to downtown businesses, because we know there's a, a strong need and a strong concentration of small business downtown. Uh, our training provider also actually offers one-on-one -on -one mentor hours, and this provider is um, very well ingrained in small business services in the entire valley. So we would encourage folks to, to take advantage of that. So please stay tuned for updates and registration links. So now I've got some, that looks like uh, somebody's calling me. So that's great. <laughs> Apparently I don't know how to turn off the notifications. I'm like, let's just see if we can, uh, we don't, we, we don't need to talk to the budget office, do we? <laughs> All right. Um, anyway, sorry about that guys. Um, so some quick general updates. Um, Karen technology is actually what they call smart parking guidance and, uh, and you see with this slide and all this information what it really means is um, it, even though it's new to Arizona and Scottsdale please don't worry we're not guinea pigs these have been launched in a lot of different communities and regions around the country and internationally um, so we like to be an early adopter but not the earliest adopter right um, so what does it really mean? Uh, by guiding visitors to available parking spaces on a mobile app they can download on their phone, um, cities have used the technology um, and, and those using it have reported increased merchant revenue, so that's something we like the idea of. Um, they've also reported greater turnover, turnover of vehicles, so people are moving their cars around um, and there's less driving around because if you are easily able to find a parking space, you're not circling the block over and over trying to figure out where they are because some of them aren't as easy to find as we'd like to think. Um, and there's also less emissions as a result. So as a, as a community that's uh, also in tune with sustainability, we like that as well. So sensors in the on-street parking spaces, so this is a little bit about the app. In downtown, they're going to allow enforcement to increase efficiency, but also at the same time, at the same time, this is going to launch a mobile app called Parker that will do that thing in terms of allowing visitors to find parking spaces. So here's, here's my little teaser. How can this help merchants, right? There is something in it for merchants as well. So the app offers a plug-in tool. So if you have a website, if you're developing one, um, you can actually embed some quick code into your site so anyone coming to visit you looking for find us or a contact page is going to get directions as well to available parking and this is available parking in real time um, anywhere that there are sensors. So please stay tuned. You may have a lot of questions on that but uh, we think it's pretty exciting and again a pilot program is just that to see how things are working out and then tweak, modify or uh, grow if it's successful. What's up with all these bikes? Has anybody seen any bikes? Yeah. Uh, okay, all right, unless you've been living under a rock um, or been vacationing somewhere else, which would be ludicrous this time of year. Um, you know that Dockless Bike Share companies have been up and running since November. We have some copies of frequently asked questions at the front desk. We've also publicized that uh, Paul's transportation team has done a great job of getting information out there and they're going to present an update and some information on what's been going on and, and what they're seeing uh, actually tomorrow night at the Transportation Commission meeting at 6 p.m. It's an informative session only. Um, you know, they will take input and feedback. Um, public can attend, listen and comment. Um, but you can also submit comments to the Transportation uh, Commission online on their comment form. So include and encourage you to get involved. We're seeing great success, but we're also seeing you know, that there are things that we're monitoring and may want to tweak over time. So I uh, appreciate your involvement there. 
I want to point out a representative uh, of one of our largest downtown employers. Where's Sophie? Sophie, Sophie. Sophie wasn't able to make it? Oh my goodness. Well, you know what? Um, here's Sophie. <laughs> um, she's with Yelp. So, so the great thing Sophie did, even in her absence, she's probably got that cold that's going around. Um, anyway, her role is being their local business partner, working with local businesses in the Valley and helping them utilize and optimize their pages on the free Yelp app. Um, so she doesn't have a sales pitch, and clearly she can't if she's not here, um, but she's not associated with sales or account management in any way. She really is here to, to forge greater partnerships with the community. So due to her assistance, uh, Yelp is giving everyone in attendance today, on your way out, if you see Mark Perator on the economic development team over here holding the wall up, um, he has some cards because she's given us uh, cards for $300 in Yelp ad credits for anyone that attends that you can use to help promote your business on Yelp. So uh, no cost to you. And then um, you can see, uh, you can either contact her later or talk to Haley. I don't know if Haley's here, but the Yelp team is happy to assist you in figuring out how to use that. So I might need to call Sophie. Um, great, all right, so getting into this, what I'd really love to do, when we held our event last October, we followed up with a survey, so hopefully, I'll, and we actually had, I think, record survey responses, which was huge. You're gonna get another one today, don't worry. Um, we asked everybody what kinds of programs and information you would find valuable, and marketing and social media was hands down. I, I think if anybody had something in common, they said we'd like to learn about that and get more resources from that regard. So today's program is a, an, a complete result of your feedback, of people that attended this event. So um, the session's gonna focus on why social media is critical to business, and it's gonna feature marketing experts, and followed up, um, we're gonna have a wonderful interactive training session. How, how many are planning on staying for the training session? Wonderful, I think about two thirds, so hopefully um, you guys are gonna get a lot out of this morning, it's gonna be a great day. So with that, you're gonna, you're gonna learn all kinds of things today about harnessing the power of social media, but I am going to now hand it over to get this panel discussion kicked off. And Rachel Pearson, who has been with Experience Scottsdale, you would never know it, I mean, she must have started when she was 12. She's been there about 17 years or more, she just told me this morning. Um, and she is the Vice President of Community and Government Affairs. And she is here to introduce our panel, to kick off a little bit about the topic, and then facilitate a Q&A. So without any more waiting, I'm gonna get Rachel right up here. Thank you all so much. I appreciate uh, you being here, and I'm excited to be up here to talk to you about social media. We all know how prolific it is, and so today it's exciting to be a part of this panel discussion to really talk about why social media is so important to your business. If you're already doing social media, I think you're gonna take some great tips about ways that you can even better leverage your time within social media. And if you have not yet joined social media, I think you're gonna get some good ideas of how to get started this morning. So these are some of the amazing social media experts that you are going to hear from today, and we'll be introducing them shortly. Um, but before we get to that, I just wanna start with some basic information about social media. At its core, social media is really about the use of technology. It's about sharing ideas and expressing oneself through an online network. That's really all we're talking about with social media. And how prolific is it? Over 170 million Americans are using social media, 69% of all American adults. So it is certainly something that is not going away anytime soon. So if you have not joined social media, this is certainly the time to do it. <coughs> we all hear about a lot of different social media platforms that are out there. And one of the things that you'll get to hear a little bit from our experts about today is how do you decide which one of these platforms? For most people, you don't have the time or the resources to do all of these. So you're gonna hear a little bit about how to decide which one is best for you. But the statistics show, this is based upon uh, stats from last November, Facebook is certainly leading the pack, followed by Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, and Snapchat. And in terms of who is using social media, we know that younger generations have sort of been born used to just being on social media. It's just sort of part of their daily lives. But really what this chart is showing is that regardless of the age range that you are in or that your customers are in, they are using social media as well and that interest is continuing to increase over time. 
So with that, I'd like to um, introduce our two panelists and ask them as I'm introducing them to please come up um, and join us at the panel. Um, first, we have Michelle Olson, who you've already seen a little bit through her incredible video with the uh, Chamber and Economic Development Team from the city. Uh, Michelle has spent most of her 31 years um, in public relations in some sort of consulting capacity. Um, she's done that with mid-sized mid firms and even really large integrated advertising firms. With her leadership, the Finger Tank Scottsdale team remains at the forefront of changing social media and interactive platforms, integrating content marketing, brand journalism, social media, and other online initiatives into all of her PR campaigns and programs. She's an active user of social media herself on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, as well as some lesser known sites, and maybe she'll tell us more about those later, to stay in contact with all of her friends and colleagues and, and all of her various interests that she has as well. Our second panelist is Anna Ebert. Uh, she is co-founder and lead trainer at Funnel Cake Social Media, and she is on a personal mission to combine her passion for marketing and small business to help those businesses succeed by providing them with social media education. Since 2008, Anna has been lucky to help a variety of companies implement their social media ch changes and strategies. At Funnel Cake's head trainer, as her, their head trainer, she will run into her in various classes, networking around town, and testing new social media features on their own social media accounts. And when she's not teaching social media, you'll find Anna traveling, reading, or doing yoga, and of course, documenting all of that on Instagram. <laughs> so with that, thank you ladies, and please join me in welcoming. So to get started this morning, um, I have a really a question for both of you. Um, again, I want to kind of start a little basic and just get an understanding from you as to why social media is so important, in, important to business and what some of the biggest benefits are. So if somebody is not yet utilizing social media, why should they be jumping in? Michelle, why don't we start with you? Okay, um, the, I first wanna start by saying we, my company and I have been doing social media since 2007, and Abby Fink is here, and I just have to tell a quick story. When we went to a conference in Cabo, where a guy spoke, um, I'm not gonna mention his name because I think he's been like indicted on sexual harassment, <laughs> but <laughs> he spoke about Twitter and he showed a, a big map of the world and he took it, he sat here and took a picture of us and then he did something with his phone and then all these little birds started chirping everywhere on this world map and Abby and I sat there going, oh my God, our world has just changed. Like imagine what this means for businesses and for public relations in general, which is our discipline. And from that moment, we became bloggers and Twitter and Facebook and everything. And then we also became snake oil salesmen trying to convince businesses that social media was the way to get their, the news out about their products and their businesses. And that wasn't popular in 2007, and you might even agree with that. 2008 was a little bit more popular, like around October when all the reporters started being fired because of the recession and, and PR people in general needed a way to get news out directly to their audiences. So this isn't new, we're 10 years into this. Um, and if you haven't jumped on board, this isn't a shaming <laughs> place. We're excited that you're here and it's changed tenfold since then. Um, we had one or two platforms then. You know, We actively manage nine or 10 platforms now for our clients and I'm sure Anna does way more than that because that's their specialty. But businesses, it's, if, if I can just kind of sum it up with a couple of things, um, it's the new word of mouth. It's where you can, you can put your information out there and really convince your, your customers and your followers that this is, this is a good thing and you can share it and it's just a, it's an amplifier. So if you put your, you control the message. So in, in media relations, often we don't get to control the message. The reporter really does that for us. In social media, we can control it and put it out there. What we can't control, and we'll talk a little bit about customer service, is how people respond to that message. And they respond to it immediately, um, within seconds sometimes. And if it's not a popular thing that you're putting out there, you'll know immediately. And I think that's where some of the fear is with small businesses in particular, and some really big businesses. We work a lot in the pharmaceutical space, and our clients are deathly afraid of putting anything out on social and having to one, respond to it, and the FDA not being happy about that response, or two, being unable to respond to it, especially if it's a, a healthcare thing, but um, we'll talk a little bit about customer service as a passion of ours in reputation management, 
and being able to just get right into your customer and have a one-to-one -one with them. Sometimes it's good and sometimes they're angry. And social has, has as you know, um, has brought a lot of anger out. There, there's some anonymity behind the keyboard, unfortunately. And um, sometimes that's good and sometimes it's not. So and being able to promote, and I'm not gonna go through the whole list of them because we would kind of want to do this back and forth thing, but being able to really control what you're telling your customer and get directly to your customer and from a business use, I think is one of the biggest benefits of social media. Yeah, absolutely, I would agree. And I have to go back anecdotally as well because um, I was in a scenario when I first uh, moved to the Valley and I had started on the marketing team and they said, what is this Facebook? And this was in 2008 and I was also in a pharmaceutical space. <laughs> Um, and they said, can you do this Facebook? You just came from college, you can do this for a business. And they said, okay, I'll give this a shot because back then you really, it was kind of uncharted territory. And like Michelle said, um, definitely a different playing field in the medical and pharmaceutical space at that time because there wasn't as much on the regulation side. Um, fast forward to today and now we've got all sorts of regulations within industries. Um, but, you know, agreeing with what Michelle said, like there's so much opportunity on social media um, just to reach your customers, whether they're existing customers, perspective, but really to paint the story of your business and share what sets you apart with that personality. Um, and a big thing too, like you were saying with reputation, a lot of times if you're choosing not to be on social media, that doesn't mean people aren't talking about you there or aren't posting about you. So being there is an opportunity to be part of that conversation and also help guide it a little bit and at least contribute so that you're not uh, turning a blind eye to maybe what is actually being said to you or said about you in the online space. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and another question for you, if you're a small business and you, you don't have a website, should you jump into social media anyhow? What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I actually um, work a lot with startups and in that space, um, as we start going through that product development, a lot of times they don't have a website yet, but they've got this incredible journey that they can be documenting along the way. And I've seen that too with just established brick and mortar businesses. Um, even a couple actually in downtown Scottsdale, I've seen before their doors even open, they have thousands of followers on their social media accounts before they even have a website necessarily. And I think there's a lot of power to that because you can have an established following before you even open the doors. Um, it's also true, depending on what your budget is, if you don't have the resources right now to have a robust website, social media can be a little bit of a, I don't want to say a band-aid in that situation, but you do get some features that can still help you, especially on Facebook, because there's so many fields on there um, that mimic some of the information you might have on a website. Uh, the downside to that is you don't get that traffic back to your, your own website, um, so to speak, and you don't get some of that rich data that the social media sites provide then. Great. Michelle, we talked before about all the platforms that are out there now, and Facebook certainly is leading the pack, but there are so many to choose from. How does a business decide which ones to jump into and which ones not to worry about when they're getting started? Or even if they're already on one, how do they, they decide if they should add it anymore? That's an excellent question, and I really think as many of you who can stay later, please stay, because Jenny's going to talk a lot about how to pick the platform that's right for you, depending on your business. Um, we, we look at, demographically, sometimes there's some variance between who uses which platforms. It's changing. Um, you've probably seen the memes that go around that say Facebook is for old people, um, when Facebook before was for college students, and that Instagram is where it's at, or Snapchat, and there's a dual there for for those folks, it's, it really depends on the audience that you're trying to reach and the story that you're trying to tell. So some of the stories that you may want to tell have um, a lot of rich video where you want a long, a long form video. And uh, don't shoot me for this, and those of you who understand social, but we put out a nine minute video in, in October. And that nine minute video has been absolutely phenomenally successful, but it's only because we put it out in a platform that could be managed. We also syndicated it, but we targeted specifically the audiences we wanted to see it. So it didn't probably go to you. It was on abuse to turn opioids. <laughs> um, exciting and sexy, huh? <laughs> but a, a regula highly regulated space in pharmaceutical. But the video we targeted to physicians, to um, advocacy groups, to addiction specialists, to pain specialists, and that kind of thing. So we knew that they would, the advocacy groups are really active on Facebook. They're not active on Instagram. 
they're not active on Snapchat. And Twitter is kind of where we put um, broad-based news. We're trying to get uh, news coverage often, and, and all of the great, greatest and some not so great news channels are active on Twitter. And so we want to make sure that we're tagging them and they're looking at us. We're trying to follow back and forth so that we can get our news that we are managing now turned into news that, that is, again, amplified this time by traditional media coverage. So it's kind of where PR and social kind of cross. But um, it really helps to understand who you're trying to reach so that you're not just doing social for the sake of social because it's super time consuming. In Twitter, you need to be on Twitter. I always had a, a rule with my staff in 2008 and now it's like five a day at least, five times a day on Twitter because it's, it's, it's consumable and then it's forgotten about. Then you can go back through your feed, but people don't because it's changing so quickly depending on the the tool you use to help manage your Twitter, you, it may be cumbersome to go back into history to see what's being tweeted. So Facebook is a little bit easier than that, Instagram is a little bit easier than that, and, and the, there are varying lengths of the, the size of the videos that you can post on different platforms. So Jenny's gonna go through all that, thank goodness, because it's really detailed and you wanna take notes for that one. But did you have anything to add, Anna? When I talk about this, I liken it to the Cheesecake Factory menu, not because I'm promoting the Cheesecake Factory, but when I'm working with small businesses, it really is. It's like someone's handed you this big, thick menu, and you're super excited at first because you're like, oh, I want all the things. I'll take you know, my appetizer, my several desserts. And it's that overwhelm when you get it all, and you're like, I've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all these things. And then it's that, that overwhelm of, I can't manage it. It's not sustainable. It's not where my audience is. So think of it that way. Just order something to start small and you can keep adding on too. So it's not, I mean, in a lot of industries, especially with small businesses, you don't have to order it all in one day. Do something, start small, get the hang of it, see how the environment is there, what your audience is responding to, and then start adding pieces or taking away pieces. Um, because, I mean, I love, you know, ordering a lot of cheesecake at the Cheesecake Factory, but let's be honest, when you get it, you're like, what, what is this big mistake I just made? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great advice, thank you. Um, with a lot of small businesses too, you also don't have a large staff. So who is best to manage social media, even if you are just starting out with your first social media account on one of these platforms, or are you better off outsourcing it? You might be a little biased, the two of you, since both of <laughs> your companies do that, but um, what, what do you recommend for small businesses? Sure. All right. Um, you know, I'm actually a little bit biased because um, I teach more education. So I'm more about empowering a small business to do their own social media as much as I love doing it myself. Um, so with that being said, I've worked with businesses who it's the receptionist managing the social media. It's the owner of the company. It's a product manager. So it really varies. And I would say whether it's that person or it's your 20 year old intern at the end of the day, it really comes down to does the person know how to manage social media and do they know how to do it for a business because social media for a business is very different than I know how to Snapchat personally or I know how to Instagram you know great boomerangs things like that so whoever it is just make sure they're supported and they have the education that's there to help you be successful in the goals that you have for your business on social media um, and as far as outsourcing I'd say there's definitely a time and place um, it depends on the complexity of your campaigns, uh, the different types of product launches you might have, you know, a new business opening is certainly a bigger thing. So I think it just depends on who you have in-house, what the reality is of someone being able to manage it day to day and what your budget is. Because when it comes down to it, it is going to be an investment. You want to really, you want to ask the right questions and you want to know what you're getting out of it, but you also want to know that you're going to pay for it um, just because you get what you pay for. <laughs> I think that's also one of the big changes from when we started this journey 10 years ago to now is, is social media used to be free. Um, it really did, even if you hired an agency to do it, we wrapped it into our PR offering because in our, off, in our shop, it was necessary. We, we didn't want to do just the traditional outreach without amplifying that um, to our audiences. Now you have to put a budget behind it and not necessarily to hire somebody, but to pay for the advertising. So, or boosting posts or doing social ads or shareables or something to get in front of a larger audience. And that can vary from you know, 10, 20 bucks a month to 
five, ten thousand dollars a month um, for some of our clients. But from a in terms of staffing, it's nice to have somebody that kind of understands what's important in your business, so that you know what should be amplified and what shouldn't. So what what should you boost? Let's not boost a a personnel announcement unless you've got a new CEO. You know, let's not um, let's really focus on the news that you want to put some money behind and decide too if you are that that person has the wherewithal to understand okay we have like four people we've got really awesome content but we've got four people following us we might want to do a likes campaign or we might and then understanding how to do that and that's when it's good to we do a lot of education too because our clients vary from a small business to a large corporation and and the corporation we might have four people on that account doing social and and on a small business, we may just have a, a, sm a social 101 and, and give them the tools and set it all up and skin the pages and make it look like their brand and then go here, you know, have, have fun. Here's your guiding. Or we may do a posting plan monthly for them so that their marketing messages are true and they can do all the social stuff, the engagement, the, the posting the photos. I did one, you are all on Facebook already. It's shocking, <laughs> probably on her account too. Um, this morning and, and tagging and just making sure that that real-time stuff is getting out where where as an agency we, you know we're not there I'm not in Idaho I'm not in New York I'm not in Boston where some of our clients are so I need to rely on them to do some of that real engagement and getting the photography because one thing that's really important is the the visual story is ever increasing in importance videos and photos um, you know there's a thing that goes around that to copy and paste if you believe we don't believe anybody reads just printed t uh, posts anymore, so put this into your, copy and paste it into your, <laughs> your um, Facebook if you believe that it's still important, and tell everybody how you met me, or some s silly thing like that. I don't do those, those are silly. Um, but it's true, you just really need to have that, that visual. So I think in terms of going back to your question, Rachel, there's so many avenues, we could be here all day. The, um, the staffing person, you know, you'll know when it's time to, to bring in. If you don't know how to do it, hire somebody to teach you. Try to do it yourselves because it's going to be a lot more authentic. And then you'll know when it's time to, to broaden that if it's taking too much time because it, the person you put in charge of it needs to have time and be dedicated. And if you walk past their, their desk or their area or they're on their phone, don't, don't shame them for that. They're working. <laughs> if you see Facebook on their on their, if it's your page, I mean, if it's like, you know, a celebrity page or, or something, you know, that's probably just a second distraction because there are a lot of distractions on social media too. So just make sure that the person you put in charge has time to do it. Especially for businesses in downtown Scottsdale, that they should be focused on putting out there. What kind of messaging? Um, I recommend anything that's important to your business. So where it's public facing, not your internal kind of stuff, but when it's gonna have an impact on your customers, if you did get a new CEO, you know, build a story around that person. Don't just post a press release or, hey, we got a new CEO, here's his picture. You know, do a video with him, a quick one, like what are you gonna, what does this position mean to you? What is the company, why did you take this job? Just fun things and then, you know, hobbies or why they like where they're at in terms of Scottsdale. What I loved about the video thing is like, I wanted to talk about Scottsdale in that video, like the whole thing and Mark kept saying, you know, you need to talk about finger paint. I'm like, I don't wanna talk about finger paint, I love Scottsdale. You know, so if you tie it into where you are and just something that's gonna be shareable because you want, the content that you're doing to be passed along to the next person because that's really the the beauty in social is that it's shareable you want somebody to pass it along you want somebody to go hey did you see this and send a link you want them to link back to your website if you have one um, and then you want to track that too so content that is interesting and engaging um, people love pictures of food sadly it's still this food porn thing that's going on so if you have a restaurant a coffee shop I loved your video by the way and I was like I love sip I go there all the time I've never been there for a beer though I just go for coffee um, but showing people in action enjoying your product and not always being um, self-serving so the self-serving content doesn't get you as far as the stuff that's interesting to other people so if you can when you're thinking about social think about what your recipient wants to see they don't want to see that you put in a new cash register system they want to they want to see that you may have a new product offering and here's what it is or they may want to see your team enjoying the area or enjoying the company you know just something that's really engaging we we keep our clients on two tracks the marketing track, which we'll usually put together a posting plan, meaning 
anything that they really need to get the news out, and that's usually a little bit more formal. And then the engagement track, and here are the things that you might want to talk about, and we categorize them and say, for a client we have in Flagstaff, for example, we'll say, you know, we need to talk about Flagstaff and things to do there and live like a local and all of this, not just here's our new house for sale and here's the, you know, all of these things and the floor plans and all of that. So we'll have those things because that's what they're paying us to do. But then we research and find out all the stuff that's going on in Flag so that we can help them, you know, tell the story of Flagstaff. And that's the stuff when we go back and look at our analytics, which we highly encourage you to do. And um, Jenny, I think you're talking about analytics too. Um, the stuff that they're clicking on the most, they'll do a real quick look at a new house or a floor plan, but then you can see the, the watch where they've done with all the Flagstaff news and the, the arts and the snow and the weather report and that kind of thing. So the engagement stuff gets a lot of traction. I think there's also a really powerful element of having a brick and mortar or community that your business is based around. Um, so for example, in downtown Scottsdale, obviously you guys have a lot of neighbors and businesses next door, and that's a really powerful element for social media because you have the opportunity, like Michelle was saying, like you're putting engagement pieces out there, but you're saying, hey, our neighbor, Sip, is you know running happy hour, or things like that. So you can partner with other businesses in the community. You've got the opportunity when there is um, you know fabulous events downtown here to say, hey, if you're coming by to check out you know, the art walk, make sure you stop by and mention the special code or whatever you have in place um, and let us know because that's also a way to track back that they saw that on social media. Um, and it's just a really cool thing to integrate that together because a lot of times um, for just solely online businesses that I work with, they don't have that connection of knowing who their neighbors are. But, you know, if you're partnering with someone else for a promotion, um, or you're just saying, hey, you're reminding people, hey, get out of your house today and come down and see us. Because remember, we all have a lot of things we could be doing. Let's be honest, some days I'd rather just sit at home. But if you give me a compelling reason to say, yeah, I should come down and check out your tea shop, or I should come try this amazing new thing, and oh, did you see this? So it's a cool opportunity to get people coming back, I think, too. Well, it seems like sharing information, not just about your business, but about your neighbors and your community is a great way to keep people engaged obviously add some additional marketing messages, but it also seems like it could be a way to help gain new followers. Because if you're talking about um, SIP and they've got a great following, they may start to show interest in your business. What are some other ways that you can possibly increase followers if you're starting out um, a little slow? Oh, that's the one I was going to start with. Actually, I have a client right now based in Scottsdale, and she was, full disclosure, I bought followers on Facebook, and I said, Oh boy, okay, that's, thank you for letting me know. That's why our Facebook analytics all say things like, you know, Africa and countries where they don't even have customers purchasing. Um, and that's really made a huge impact on our traction on Facebook, for example. Um, so I would say don't buy followers. Uh, it might be short term, hurrah, you've got followers. But remember, you want quality followers and not quantity of them. If you've got five super engaged followers and they're purchasing, they're coming by to see you, I'd take that any day over five million who aren't doing anything. Um, so just know, be authentic. Like we were saying with the partnerships, yes, there is a strategic thing when you're looking at engaging with other businesses. It's good karma, but it's also good because then you're getting in front of their community of, oh no, hundreds of other followers. Um, so it's funny how that works, but just be authentic and you know when you're asking people and take advantage of opportunities in your other marketing efforts to build your followers. So if it's in your e-blast, having reminders, your sync file and your email, um, having a sign up in your shop saying, hey, you love this copy, use our hashtag, Instagram it, um, things like that to just get that reminder in front of people to say, oh, that's right, you're on social media, I wasn't following you. Um, and then at the end of the day, hopefully, ideally, you get the people saying, hey, you should follow so-and-so on social media because they're really funny, they're awesome, they're local, great personality. So it does take a little bit of work, but um, there's ways to do that organically. I would um, add to that, the, the sharing of other people's content is a, could be construed as an implied endorsement. And, um, be careful when you're doing that, but don't. I mean, it's it's like that fine line. Be be generous with your um, with your sharing. <laughs> be generous with your social sites to the extent that that you know the person's content that you're sharing. Try to stay out of the political thing, and you'll get more people trusting you. Oddly, because 
politics can be a shocker, kind of polarizing. Um, so if you're if you're especially on Twitter, you know, really engage with people and retweeting. If you're if you're going down the Twitter route, retweeting really in, interesting things brings other people following you. And when you're at a, an event like this. Um, I tweet the nuggets that other people are saying and I tag the folks who are saying it. And I do that all the time to the extent that the, the, my boss now is like, I can always tell when you're at a conference because your Twitter feed goes crazy and then all these people start tweeting your hashtag and it's like, yes, this is how it works. <laughs> you know. Um, so it's, it's really important, I think, to do that. And on the buying side of things, if, if you really do need to, to start up your Twitter by buying, don't just don't. Um, it's it's a waste of money. The people that you're gonna get are like Anna said. They're in Africa. We had cleaned up a, a company in in Boise, Idaho's um, Twitter feed, and they had bought worked with a guy to buy like I don't know. It was like three or four thousand, and they were like hookers and like all these horrible things. The smoke shops, not that smoke shops are bad for some people, but they are. You know, for this, it was a, it, this was a spa. The company that we were promoting was a spa and they had hookers. So we had to clean that up. So we unfollowed all of these people and that were there and ended up with this one. Sadly, we ended up just starting a whole new Twitter because they started the wrong way and, and the cleanup takes a lot of time. Um, contacting people that you really admire in a Twitter environment and saying, please follow me back because I really want to have this dialogue with you because you can't direct message someone on Twitter unless they're following you back. Um, so that's kind of interesting too. So there are organic ways. We On your email, you, you all have emails, I hope, with your company names and not Gmail. If you do, in your signature, put your a link to your social sites in there. You can do that with the, with the bug, the little icon or just, you know, mine's at Shelby O, um, so I'll put at Shelby O, and now we've got the little bugs that we have. So do that. A lot of the clients that we work with in the hospitality space, like TripAdvisor and Yelp are super important, and we spend a significant amount of time helping to manage review sites, Google reviews, and there's one now called Pissed Off Consumer. <laughs> um, so they're all over the place, but on the customer service side, so when, we, when you're, trying to build up your following, just put that, like, and I said, put it everywhere. You know, tell your, because people need reminding. You know, we're, we're a very distracted society and we need reminding that you've got, you're on Twitter, you're on Instagram, and just put it everywhere that's in their faces to remind them. Ask them, hey, follow me. It's okay, it's not embarrassing, just do it. <laughs> Ladies, thank you for some great advice and a few uh, warning labels on social media as well, things to kind of avoid. Um, I think that's all good advice. In the interest of time, we're going to wrap up so that we...